Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Pillars of Great Pollinator Habitat Design and Management. My name is Julia Freuk. I'm the project coordinator here at the Partnership for Ag Resource Management, and we'll be hosting the webinar this morning. We are joined today by Craig Fissenick, Program Director for the Sand County Foundation. I'm also pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Pete Bertholson, Partnership Director for the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. Before we begin, I will go over some brief logistics. Please make use of the question box on your screen to type questions for Pete during his presentation. I will moderate the questions during the last 10 to 15 minutes of the webinar after the presentation. We suggest viewing the webinar while connected via Ethernet for best audio quality performance. You will receive an email in the next few days with the webinar recording and a webinar evaluation. The recording will also be available on partnershipfarm.org. By attending today's webinar, you are eligible for 1.5 CCA continuing education units, one for integrated pest management and 0.5 for sustainability. You must be present for the entire webinar to receive those points. For CCAs, if you submitted your CCA number at registration and are watching the webinar live, your CEUs will be automatically submitted. If you are watching this on demand at a later date, please be sure to watch the entire presentation through the GoToWebinar platform and not YouTube to receive credit. You must submit your CCA number at registration to receive CEUs. If you watch the webinar recording more than two weeks after the original broadcast, please email julia at partnershipfarm.org your CCA number to ensure your credits are submitted. Please make a big note that credits often take a few weeks to appear in your account. If it has been more than four weeks, please contact my email. And now, with the logistics taken care of, I will provide a quick introduction on the Partnership for Ag Resource Management. The Partnership for Ag Resource Management is an effort of our nonprofit IPM Institute, along with many other projects in agriculture and communities, each focused on using the power of the marketplace to improve sustainability. IPM works with food companies and farmers around the world to improve practices and performance, and to communicate those benefits to buyers and the public. We also work with pest control companies, hospitals, schools, and other facilities to address pest problems with efficient pesticide use. Much like food companies, egg retailers have a business imperative to communicate more about their efforts to address impacts their operations have on environment and health. Our goal with the Partnership for Egg Resource Management is to collaborate with egg retailers to identify and promote revenue generating products and services that keep inputs on cropland. We track sales of these through annual surveys and calculate estimated nutrient loss reductions for several. We then provide a confidential individual nutrient stewardship report to participating egg retailers that compares location info with averaged adoption trends within your state and basin. We also provide an aggregate survey report, which is posted on our website under the Egg Retailer tab. We work with retailers and industry associations to publicize survey results through press releases and articles. It's important to get the positive news out there to address misperceptions the public may have about agriculture. We're all aware of the water quality challenges we face, from the record-breaking algal blooms in the western Lake Erie Basin to the expansive hypoxic zones in the Gulf of Mexico. We know phosphorus runoff is coming primarily from cropland because of the timing of the loads. They spike during snowmelt and rain events in winter and early spring, following fall applications. The increased levels of phosphorus in the water feed algal bloom growth, which close beaches to swimming, make fishing a challenge, and have also shut down public water supplies. The graph on the upper left-hand corner shows the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's annual data on algal bloom severity in the western Lake Erie Basin since 2002. We can see on average that algal blooms are becoming more frequent and severe, making it increasingly important to convey the economic and environmental benefits of egg retailer offered products and services like cover crops and variable rate application that help retain nutrients on fields. 
Our team also provides free resources for egg retailer employees, grower clients, and consultants, available on our website, partnershipfarm.org. On the left is our continually updated and 4R approved agronomist handbook, available free for download. The handbook includes algal bloom updates, trends in customer product and service adoption, and fact sheets for your grower customers to increase awareness of products and services that reduce nutrient runoff. Our phosphorus loss reduction wallet cards are on the right and can also be ordered for free on our website. These are a great conversation starter with your customers and can also serve as handouts and meetings. Parm also offers cost shares to egg retailers and is launching a cover crop incentive this month for retailers in the Blue Earth River Watershed in Minnesota and the Yahara River Watershed in Wisconsin through support from the McKnight Foundation. Egg retailer customers that are new to cover crops or are expanding acres that have no cover crop history are eligible for $15 per acre for up to 80 acres to cover the cost of seed. For more information, contact our research, research, resource management specialist, Michelle Wigern at michelle at partnershipfarm.org. Remember to sign up for Parm News via our website to be the first to receive information on our latest cost shares, developed educational materials, events, and more. Our, we our next webinar is the final in our Great Lakes Conservation Connect series. Airing in late March, it will feature a panel discussion between farmers and landowners on how they have worked together to integrate and improve conservation practices on rented lands. Register for the webinar on our part on our website partnershipfarm.org. Our regular PARM series will resume in June. Stay tuned for the topic and air date. Please note we also take into consideration your suggestions for webinar topics, so be sure to fill out our evaluation form after today's webinar. We also invite you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for PARM updates and industry news. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Sand County Foundation and the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. We will now hear from Craig Fissinick, Program Director for the Sand County Foundation. So welcome everybody. I'm thrilled to see so many people joining the webinar this morning, especially those of you who are uh, certified crop consultants or representatives in the ag retail sector. I'm going to briefly introduce Sand County Foundation and explain why we chose to host this topic and to invite Pete Berthelsen uh, to speak about it. Uh, Sand County Foundation is a national nonprofit conservation organization. We're based in Wisconsin, and our mission is to support voluntary conservation on private working lands, mainly with farmers and ranchers. Um, one of our main programs is the Leopold Conservation Award. This is an annual award. It's given in each of 14 states and growing across the country. And it, it, it recognizes farmers and ranchers who exemplify uh, good land management and conservation of soil and water and wildlife resources while making a living off the land. Uh, we do some individual work with farms um, to improve water quality, specifically doing uh, conservation practice demonstration and monitoring. For example, here you see a paired catchment runoff study to uh, track nutrient and sediment runoff improvement through various conservation practices. So that's at the commercial farm scale. At the watershed scale, we have some projects for capacity building of watershed leaders. Uh, specifically, we operate the Leadership for Midwestern Watersheds annual uh, professional networking series for peer learning by folks who run these small watershed-based agricultural water quality improvement efforts. Specific to pollinator habitat, um, we, are, uh, we are demonstrating the prairie strips practice. Some of you may have heard from this exciting work coming out of Iowa State and the prairie strips team. We're partnering with a handful of farmers in southern Wisconsin to expand this practice here. Um, it's primarily a water quality practice, uh, capturing the sediment and nutrient runoff with narrow strips of prairie within row crops. Um, but it also has a, a kind of a along for the ride come pollinator and other wildlife benefits by using the natural native orb and grass vegetation. 
Um, that's in the agricultural sector. In the energy area, we're partnering with a number of utilities and rural electric co-ops um, to convert some unutilized land, for example, here around an electric substation into pollinator habitat. Um, you know, our motive behind this work is that for increasing pollinator and monarch butterfly habitat on the rural and agricultural and working landscape, there are a lot of opportunities. There are nooks and crannies in various places that can be developed into habitat without having to sacrifice agricultural production or interrupt other economic activities on the land. And as an example of this, I referenced the Iowa Farm and Rural Life Poll from 2016, which included some questions about monarch butterfly habitat and farmers responding to the poll, 14% expressed a willingness to establish up to an acre of habitat for monarch butterflies with no financial assistance, 21% willing to offer at 50% financial assistance and higher rates with more financial assistance. So there is some willingness to find small patches of land on, on private lands. Um, also, as we hear uh, through a number of research studies and surveys about outreach to uh, farmers and <clears throat> private landowners, um, crop consultants, not surprisingly, rank highest or very high for uh, the trust that farmers give them in agronomic information, and sometimes also with conservation information or at least a uh, strong potential um, for the private sector crop consultants and retailers uh, to provide conservation information to farmers as well, where they already have these trusted relationships with the farmers. So uh, going to my last slide here, I'm going to quickly profile uh, in the spirit of all of this uh, uh, effort or interest in promoting habitat uh, opportunities on private lands, we've developed this incentive program, this is a small pilot incentive program, have a limited number of awards available, but I want to make those of you who are certified crop consultants, independent or uh, through an ag retailer, um, aware of this, of this incentive program. Um, the details are online <clears throat> at the website at the bottom of the screen here, but in essence, um, you know, there are a lot of incentives out there for, for the landowner or the land manager. Uh, we wanted to create something that would be directed towards the crop consultant to help advise their client on uh, possibly creating some habitat, um, especially for those of you who might use precision ag software uh, programs to identify low return or negative return on investment, small portions of fields. This may be an appropriate place if, if, if a piece of land or a corner or edge of a field is maybe not going to go into production next year, uh, could we take an extra step and invest in the you know, seed and establishment for the native prairie habitat, the, the work that Pete's going to talk about here in a second. So please visit this website, contact me. Uh, my information is on the website link below um, and, uh, or send in an application. It's fairly simple. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And with that, I will uh, hand it off. All right, thank you, Craig, and to the Sand County Foundation and the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund for sponsoring today's webinar. Now we'll get the presentation started with Pete Berthelsen, Partnership Director for the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. All right, well, good morning, everybody, and Welcome to a presentation. I'm excited uh, about the opportunity to be able to chat about some of these things today. Um, Julie, I'm not able to see the opportunity to advance the slide at the bottom of the screen. Okay, let me change that for you. Okay, it's advancing on its own now. Um, I still don't see that at the bottom of the screen, Julia, like we had earlier. Okay, um, you should be seeing it now towards the bottom. I need you to, to make the image a little bit smaller because the bottom of it is cut off, so I'm unable to see that.
Can you see it there now? There we go. Okay. Yep. Now I got it. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody, and here we go. I want to give just a quick introduction uh, to you to who I am, since most of you probably aren't familiar with me. This is a photo of uh, my lovely wife and I as we're conducting a prescribed burn on our native prairie. Uh, we reside in the central Lus Hills of Nebraska. It's a rolling topography that's broken almost evenly between uh, row crop production and uh, pasture ground. And um, we're very fortunate to have what I think is one of the more beautiful pieces of ground in the country. And we use our farm and ranch a little bit like an outdoor laboratory uh, to demonstrate <clears throat> and show some of the different things that I'm gonna chat about today. I am a beekeeper, um, a, a small scale beekeeper. I'm a wildlife biologist with 36 years of working in the wildlife field. But but what I really am, the thing that describes me the best, is that I'm somebody that's very passionate about working to have high quality, high diverse habitat on the landscape. And this is a little bit of uh, what we're gonna be chatting about uh, today. So uh, for today's audience, <clears throat> it's pretty pretty diverse audience that we have here today with, uh, as Craig mentioned, crop consultants. I know there's beekeepers on here, people in the agricultural world, pollinate, pollinator enthusiasts, master gardeners, a very wide range of people that are interested in this topic. So that's a wide range of people to talk about how to do these things. So one of the things that Julia mentioned is that this webinar is being recorded and will be available at a later date uh, for you to be able to watch. So if you're sitting there and I'm going through things quickly and you want to be taking notes and writing things down, you can sure do that. But I would encourage you to just probably more listen to what we're going to chat about today. And then uh, if you need more detail to come back to the presentation later on to get that level of detail. I guess I'm going to start by <clears throat> making the, the point that I think pollinators and pollinator habitat are a new kind of glue that can bind together a broad range of interests that can go from water quality to soil health, food sustainability, wildlife habitat, precision agriculture, many, many broad different factors can come together through this connection of pollinators and pollinator habitat. I'm also going to start by saying that um, my viewpoint and the things that I'm going to talk about today really have a foundation in three points. The first being that when we get the opportunity to have habitat, pollinator habitat on the landscape, we need to make sure that it's the best habitat that it can be. If you're listening today, and you're a resource professional that works with a conservation program, we don't have enough acres of wildlife habitat on the landscape, as many as we need. So when we get the opportunity to have an acre of it, we need to make it the best that it can be. The next philosophy <clears throat> that I kind of come with today is that if we try to design wildlife habitat, talk about pollinators the way that we have for the last 10 or 20 years and attempt to do things in the same way, we're probably not going to be successful. And I think perhaps one of the greatest examples of that is the monarch butterfly that is currently being listed uh, or considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act. If we try to address those population concerns, doing things the way that we've been doing them the last 10 years, we're probably not going to be successful. And the last kind of foundational thought that I come to you today with these things are, is that not all pollinator habitat is created equal. And these are some of the things that we'll chat about today about how to get the best possible results out of every acre 
that we work on. So with that, we'll, we'll kind of start and jump into what I've called the three pillars of habitat management. And those pillars are site preparation, what it is that you're going to plant your seed mixture, and how you're going to manage it both once you've planted it and then in the future. So with that, let's jump into the first one. And I think that this is the most important factor and that's site preparation. So contrary to what you might hear or see on television, we do not have a time machine. And what I mean by that is, as a wildlife professional, one of the most frustrating things that I can deal with is if we've worked on a project and three years, five years, six years into the future, somebody is disappointed with the results that they got, that's pretty disappointing to me because that time, the three years, the five years, that investment is the most valuable aspect that we have and something that uh, we really need to get the best results from. Because this image here is what everybody thinks of when you hear pollinator habitat. Everybody thinks about the calendar that's in your office, and when you turn it to the month of July, that gorgeous photo that you see with all these flowering plants. That's what everybody thinks of when they say, we're gonna do some pollinator habitat, and often what they get in year one is something that looks a little bit more like this. And in about something like year six, something that looks a little bit more like this. And in virtually every situation, if somebody is ever disappointed with what they got, it almost always comes back to site preparation. So site preparation is just critically important and something that we're going to talk a little bit about right now. So the first aspect of this that I'm going to go into is how you plant your seed. And um, there's probably plenty of people on the call that are interested in doing their planting with a broadcast seeding. You can do it uh, with a device like we have right here that is <clears throat> just slings the seed out on the landscape. Uh, hopefully in a uniform manner. Another option is an air sprayer or a granular applicator like this. One of the most important aspects of broadcast seeding is that we have to have great seed to soil contact. In this image right here, you'll see that this site has been prepared in a manner that when that seed comes out and hits the ground, the likelihood that the seed touches soil is really, really high, and it's very likely this will be a great uh, seeding. The opposite of this could be if you were working in an area that was in, in existing grass and you've killed off the grass, but that residue of the grass still remains, that could very well be an example of where the seed has a hard time making contact with the soil. So seed to soil contact is really important and we can do that in a number of ways uh, with a broadcast spreader, the granular applicator, or you can do it the old fashioned way and just kind of Johnny apple seed it across the ground. When we have good seed to soil contact, like what we've had in this example that went into existing crop stubble, we get great results. And if you were able to take a look at this site that is about four months post planting, and you actually kind of get down there and look a little bit harder as to what's happening, in about one square foot of ground in this field, you can find all kinds of seedlings, areas where the seed has had proper seed to soil contact and it has germinated and we have a plant that is actually growing. And that's really what we're looking for. If you're going to broadcast seed, it's critically important 
that number one, we've removed the competition, and number two, that we have uh, great seed soil contact. In areas where seed to soil contact might be a concern, that's where we think about using things like a no-till grass drill. And in this example, this drill actually takes the seed, falls down uh, through a tube, and it lands <clears throat> into a furrow that has been created in the soil. The whole purpose of a drill is to maximize the seed to soil contact. So a no-till drill, like what is featured in this photo right here, can do a great job of helping with that. Next, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of planting depth. And I want to talk about how this has changed. How we look at the importance of planting depth has changed with time, just like agriculture has changed from this two row corn picker to something that is now a very modern, very large combine. How we think about planting depth in a wildlife planting, a pollinator planting, has really changed a lot. In this example, I want to show you five different uh, pollinator seeds that we could commonly use in a seed mixture. And when you look below each little stack of seed and you see that number, that is how many seeds of that species it takes to make one pound of seed. So on smooth milkweed, it requires 70,000 seeds to produce one pound of seed. In a species called slender beard's tongue, it takes 10.8 million seeds to make one pound. That's a pretty significant difference. 154,000 times the change in seed size. So when you look at a typical pollinator mixture and you look at the different seeds that are made up in there, think about what the rule of thumb is for the proper planting depth. The proper planting depth of any seed is generally two times the diameter of the seed. So if we take a good close look at some of the different individual seeds and the sizes in this handful of seed, some of these seeds are very, very small. The ones that make up the 10.8 million seeds in a pound are so small that if those seeds were planted at a quarter of an inch deep in the ground, it's very likely that you'll never see them in your planting. Mother Nature really designed those seeds to be left on the top of the ground. So one of the important things that you want to take away as a lesson and, a, and something to remember from this is that you can plant seed too deep, you cannot plant it too shallow. So um, if you're using a drill or some sort of a method that actually puts the seed into the ground, one eighth of an inch should kind of be your goal for a pollinator seed mixture. And know that if it's deeper than that, there very well could be species that aren't going to show up and become established in your seed mixture. Uh, dormant seeding <clears throat> is where we plant seeds in the fall and then have winter's freezing and thawing action help break some of the seed dormancy to increase germination. And there are many species that are probably very highly prized to go in a pollinator seed mixture that come with what's called a seed dormancy, a hard seed coat that will um, reduce germination until that seed dormancy is broken. And so if we planted these six species in the fall, and they sat there throughout the winter and went through freezing and thawing and rain and snow, it would actually increase the rate at which these species germinated. 
And if you think about it, that's how Mother Nature does it. So here's a couple of key things to think about if you're doing what we refer to as a dormant seeding. In this photo, this is where seed was broadcast across the top of the snow. This, these keys that I'm going to give you can be used whether you're using a drill or you're broadcast seeding it. The first thing is don't do a dormant seeding until your soil temperatures have reached 50 degrees or lower. And that's because we don't want that seed to germinate. We want it to sit there over winter, go through those freezing and thawing cycles, and be available uh, in the spring for germination. It's really important that we make sure, again, that we have that great seed to soil contact, especially if you're broadcast seeding it. Think about this photo that's behind these words here and the fact that these seeds have been broadcast onto the snow. When that snow melts, the seeds go down with the melting snow, and as long as they're able to contact soil and not other vegetation, they're gonna have a high likelihood of being able to germinate and grow. And then the other thing is, is if you're particularly doing a broadcast seeding, but also drilling, if you do your dormant seeding, ahead of a snow or rain, that snow and or rain will really help improve and increase your seed soil contact. So those are a couple of keys related to dormant seeding. Next, I wanna talk just a little bit about if you want to plant pollinator habitat into existing grasses. <clears throat> and the first thing that I'll say is that planting pollinator habitat into an area where you have existing grass is by far, without question, the hardest platform to work with. So I'm going to talk about an example of where we're going to uh, recommend a couple of strategies to improve your success when you're planting pollinator habitat into existing habitat. The first thing that I'll say, and this may not work in many examples, but the first thing that I'll say is that if you have an area that's in existing grass and you want to convert it to pollinator habitat, the best way to go about doing that is to actually return it to agricultural production for one growing season. And what we recommend is that you consider planting it to soybeans, Treat it like conventional agriculture for one growing season and then do a dormant seeding that fall. For some of you that are on this webinar, that might seem like kind of a foreign concept, but think about an area that's in existing grass and the extreme competition that your pollinator seeds are going to face. They're going to face two forms of really strong competition. One is the grasses that you see above ground. They're established, they're going to provide a lot of competition for nutrients, for sunlight, for space, for pollinator species that probably can't handle a lot of competition. The second form of competition that your pollinator seed mixture will face in an area with existing grasses is what kind of competition are they going to have below ground? So an area that is in existing grass is very likely going to have the grass root systems that have completely filled up the soil horizon and are also providing competition below ground. So if it works, if it fits with your objectives, the gold standard for working on an area that is an existing grass is to convert it to row crop production of soybeans for one season, remove and eliminate the grasses, remove the root competition below ground, and the soybeans will also add some nitrogen to the soil to boost your pollinator seeding when those seeds germinate and start to grow. 
If that doesn't work, <clears throat> the next best option, and this also <clears throat> may not work for everybody as well, but the next best op option in my experience is to use a glyph glyphosate application on the existing grasses in the fall. Um, grasses that are cool season grasses have the one weakness that in the fall, after a hard freeze, which is 27 degrees or colder for three consecutive hours, most of the Forbes species have gone dormant for the year, but your cool season grasses, which are the primary grass competition in most areas, are still green and growing and are very vulnerable to a glyphosate application. In this photo, if you take a look at this, there's a lot, this is late in the year, after a hard freeze, there are many forb species in this grass field that this glyphosate application will not impact because they are no longer green and growing and have gone dormant for the year. The grasses that were in this field, which were comprised of smooth brome, fescue, and Kentucky bluegrass will be highly impacted by this glyphosate application. So it's a way of removing the grasses and keeping the forbs. And here's, here's an example of what I mean for what this can look like. This photo is actually of a grassland that had a prescribed fire uh, conducted on it. But the area in the middle of the screen that appears to be black is the area that was sprayed with glyphosate the last fall, the, the preceding fall. <clears throat> the green area has all those cool season grasses that were in there that were not impacted by the fire, actually probably enhanced by the fire. The black area in the middle of the screen is what received the glyphosate application in the fall. And if you walked out there and looked at that, all of the forbs that were in there have now been released. That competition has been removed and they're going to be in there and expand and do very well. So if you wanted to apply glyphosate, here's a couple of keys. And this is a good example of where don't worry too much about writing everything down because we can. Um, review this during the recorded portion of this afterwards, but these are some of the keys that you want to make sure are in place if you're going to spray an area that has existing grass on it. If you follow these keys right here, you'll get great results. Next we'll chat a little bit about planting pollinator habitat into existing crop stubble. In this photo, we're using a no-till drill, but in this example, you probably would have the opportunity to either broadcast or drill into here. And you could broadcast seed into this site because you're going to have a fair amount of seed to soil contact, especially if you did the broadcasting in the uh, fall and let the winter snow and rain work that seed down into the soil. So planting into crop stubble, as I mentioned earlier with the option of using beans as a way to uh, control existing grass is probably producing our best results for establishing pollinator habitat. But there's one critically important component that you really need to look at. And that is what the herbicide use history was. If I had an area of crop stubble that was in an agricultural crop last year in 2018, and this spring I wanted to plant pollinator habitat into it, I would really need to very carefully look at what herbicides were used on that site last year in 2018. This is an example of just a, a very brief chart that shows 
the residual impact of a number of herbicides. And if on my crop, something like, say, a herbicide called Callisto was used, that has an 18-month residual. So if I was unaware that that herbicide was used last year, and this spring I wanted to plant pollinator habitat in there, that herbicide that was used last year would be doing its job by preventing my pollinator planting from establishing, germinating, and growing in that same field this year. So it's something that you want to have a really close look at. My experience is, is that if your site was in corn the previous year, there's about a 70% chance that it could have had a herbicide on it that has a residual that will impact your pollinator planting. If that site was in soybeans last year, there's only about a 30% chance that a herbicide was used on that site last year. So if you're listening to today's webinar and you're a resource professional that has worked on these sort of projects before and established pollinator habitat in areas that were formerly in row crop production and you had a really poor result from your pollinator planting, think about whether or not this aspect of things was looked at and how it may have had an impact on things. So next we're gonna to go to uh, seed mixtures and talk about the importance of seed mixtures. And this is where I wanna put the importance back on the person that wants to have the project done. And I call this the art and science of thinking about your project before you do anything. And here's what I mean by that. <clears throat> there are a number of key factors that you have to think about and identify before a seed mixture can be designed. So as a wildlife professional that designs lots of pollinator seed mixtures, here's six things that I absolutely have to know before I can start designing somebody's seed mixture. Geography, where are you located? We have to use plants that are found in your area and occur there naturally and they'll work. Gotta know what the budget is, whether you're a private landowner or a corporation, a utility company, a, ro a department of transportation, there's a budget for every project you're gonna do. And if we designed the world's greatest pollinator mixture, but it costs $900 an acre, well, that might not work with very many budgets, probably not many at all. And so knowing what your budget is, is pretty important. The next thing that I just have to know is how are you gonna plant it? Are you gonna broadcast seed it or are you gonna drill it? And that will influence how we design that seed mixture. The next thing is the pollinator value of the seed mixture. I'm gonna talk quite a bit more about this in just a couple of minutes, but determining what the pollinator value is is pretty critically important. And remember that not all pollinator habitat is created equal. The next thing that we have to know and consider as a really important factor is what kind of soil do you have? Is it a sandy site? Is it loamy? Is it heavy clay? Those different answers will influence which species are available to go into your seed mixture. And then the site preparation. Is this seed mixture going into something that was in crop stubble? Is it going into an area with existing grasses that have been terminated? All of those things will influence your seed mixture. And they're not the only ones. Those are the six most important ones, but there's all kinds of other factors that you have to decide before a seed mixture can be made. And those are things like, um, which pollinator species do you wanna benefit? Do you wanna benefit honeybees? Or you wanna benefit monarch butterflies? That will significantly influence your seed mixture. 
what tools will be available to you to manage this site? Uh, does it have to be, is it a prairie restoration where we want to use 100% native and local ecotype seed? Or can you use naturalized forage legumes uh, in your seed mixture? What's the weed history and competition on the site? Critter attractiveness is if this was a project that uh, say we were doing with the Department of Transportation in a situation where maybe you don't want to be attracting deer to the site, then we probably would be very thoughtful about what species are gonna go in that mixture and make sure that we're not using those things that are so highly attractive to deer in that seed mixture. The other factor that we have to think about is when we design a seed mixture, we have to design things that will be there and provide pollinator value for the entire growing season. In my world, that's April to October. And when you look at all these flower images that are popping up on the screen, they all have great pollinator value. There's lots of different colors, lots of different sizes and shapes. It's great to put these in a pollinator seed mixture, but there's a problem. Every single one of these species flowers in the month of July. And if that is all that we had in our pollinator seed mixture, we haven't provided nectar and pollen floral resources across the entire growing season. So we really need to think about how we can do that across the entire year. I talked a little bit about pollinator value and my belief that not all pollinator habitat is created equal. So here's a couple of thoughts about pollinator value. The first is that the more things you put in your mixture, the more species that you have in your seeding mixture, the higher quality it's gonna be. And here's an example of what I mean about this. Don't worry about the names and things that are in here. What this graph shows you is that the more different species that are in your plant mix, your seed mixture, the more pollinator species you'll benefit. The more species you have in your seed mixture, the more pollinators you'll benefit. And next I wanna show you about some really cool tools that can be used that will help in this area. This image is a screenshot of a seed calculator. You're not gonna be able to read those things and don't worry about it because you don't need to. What you want to know is that a great seed calculator that will design a seed mixture needs to tell you things like how many seeds per square foot each species in your mixture will be at. And then it also needs to provide you information about pollinator value, because not each species has the same pollinator value. Some plant species that are flowering in your mixture really will have very limited pollinator value, and some are highly prized by a wide range of part pollinators. So you want to be thinking about having somebody design your pollinator seed mixture that has a tool that creates all the things you want. What's my seeding rate based on how many seeds per square foot? And in this example, this mixture was in one square foot of ground, we had 20 seeds that would germinate and grow in one square foot of ground. Pretty good seeding rate. The next part of this tells you how many plant species are gonna be out there providing floral resources throughout the entire year. This mixture had 38 different species in it, and it was flowering from April to October. And then it has that price in there so it can help you with your budget. But the main thing I wanna show is that this seed calculator also gives you a score, a pollinator, value score for your seed mixture. And if you're not considering that, you that's where we can fall into the case of where 
we're not uh, making every acre the best that it can be. A pollinator value score of your seed mixture is a really important consideration that you want to have. The next consideration on your seed mixture is what pollinator species do you want to benefit? Whether it's honeybees or monarch butterflies or native bees, or maybe you just want to benefit all pollinators. Those are all factors that will determine how your seed mix is designed and the seeding rate and the species that go into it. If somebody said, I want a seed mixture that's primarily for honeybees, and the next person said, I want a seed mixture that's going to save my friend the monarch butterfly, those are very, very different pollinator seed mixtures, and those are factors that go into how you design that. Talked a little bit about uh, monarch butterflies right there, so I'm sure that everybody that's on the call clearly understands the relationship between a milkweed species and how important it is for monarch butterflies. But common milkweed, which is shown in this photo, sometimes comes with a little bit of reputation in agriculture where it might not be viewed as fondly. Well, one of the things that you want to bear in mind and remember is that there are many different species of milkweed out there. All of them can be used by monarch butterflies. And the, many of these other milkweed species don't come with some of the same uh, reputation uh, that occurred in agriculture. So there's lots of different milkweed species that can be used. Talked a little bit <clears throat> about budget. And I, I think this is just one of the critically important factors of when you're designing a seed mixture. Because again, if, if you design a seed mixture that costs $900 an acre, and you think this is just the best pollinator seed mixture that's ever been created, but it's more expensive than what people can use, then we probably really haven't moved the bar on what we need. And I often hear about pollinator seed mixtures that cost $500, $700, $900 an acre. And I think that they do, I know that poll great pollinator seed mixtures do not have to cost that much. And pollinator seed mixtures can be designed using new technology to produce great results. And here's my example. I'm going to show you um, a species called showy partridge pea. It's found throughout lots of the U.S. east of the Rocky Mountains. It's one of the least expensive wildflower seeds you can buy, $13.59 a pound. And then I want to show you another one. This species is called slender beard's tongue. Really important for bumblebees. It flowers in the month of May, which is a hard time to come up with species that will do that. Um, a great pollinator species, but it's also one of the most expensive pollinator species out there. Well, I wanna to demonstrate to you how if a seed, a pollinator seed mixture is designed using a seed calculator and based on seeds per square foot, don't let that cost worry you. So here's our two species. Side by side, you can see the seeds there. Uh, we talked about what the prices are, the least expensive to one of the most expensive. And here's how many seeds make up one pound of seed for both of them. 43,000 versus 10.8 million seeds. Well, if we designed a seed mixture where we had one seed per, squ per four square feet in the field. And remember that if we're designing a seed mixture with 40, 50, 60 different species in it, having a seeding rate of one seed per four square feet in a mixture is probably an appropriate amount. 
if you've designed your seed mixture that way, the least expensive wildflower species out there costs $3.40 an acre to include in your seed mixture. That's not a bad price. But the most expensive pollinator species out there costs even less when your seed mixture is designed based on the number of seeds per square foot of ground. So don't let price scare you and make sure that your seed mixtures are designed properly. And know that a seed mixture is like a balance scale. And if grasses ever comprise more of the seeding mixture than wildflowers, they always win out. So if we go back to that seed calculator and the things that we showed you earlier, you really wanna take a look at what percentage of the overall mixture are grasses and what percentage are wildflowers. If your objectives are pollinator value, I like to see grasses be no greater than 25% of your seeding rate. Now, if your objectives are things beyond pollinator, like say water quality, and you're, you, you wanna use this seed mixture in a buffer, you would have more grass in it. This is where your objectives have to be identified so that we can figure out exactly how to design your seed mixture to meet all of those objectives. Because if you haven't thought about that and grasses are 50% of the seeding mixture or greater, grasses always win. And with time, your pollinator seed mixture ends up looking like this. Grasses always win. It's kind of like uh, if I'm a Forb and Usain Bolt is a grass, he's probably always going to beat me in the 100-yard dash. So I need to have the head start of racing Usain Bolt in the 100-yard dash. I need to start at about the 50-yard line, and that's, or that is what having a higher percentage of Forbes in your seed mixture will do. Now, the reality is that might not be a great uh, analogy because he'd probably still beat me even if I started at the 50-yard line. All right, the other thing that uh, kind of closing up this section is that we want to plan for weed competition because this is an example of what lots of things look like early on. I want to give a quick comment about weeds. This is a soybean field. And if you take a look at a couple of the plants that showed up in here, that's corn. Last year, this field was planted to corn and that was the crop. This year, corn that shows up in the soybean field is a weed. A weed is simply a plant that is in a place that we don't want it. I, I just want to give that perspective because not all weeds are bad. Not all of them. Some of them, yes, but not all of them. So I want you to go forward with a pollinator planting with this perspective. Your pollinator planting is going to change over time. Each year it can look different. Watch it, understand what's happening, and enjoy the process of how your pollinator planting changes over time. We can think about how to uh, control um, weeds early on by using early establishing plants, annuals, and things that show up very quickly, including them in our seed mixture, so that they help keep weeds at bay. Those are some of the ways that we want to design a mixture. If you're not doing a prairie restoration and you just want to do something to benefit pollinators, you could think about including naturalized forage legumes in there as well. So the last pillar that we're going to talk about is the need to have regular routine maintenance. This is an example of a pollinator project where when you turn your back on this project, and haven't provided management for a number of years, this project had trees that started showing up in there. 
woody encroachment, depending on where you're at in the country, can be something that happens and something that you want to plan for. Establishment mowing can be really important in the first year of planting. This is an example of a study that documented that mowing in the first year increased the viability of the pollinator planting. And here you can see an example of a plant where on one part of it, it was not mowed, the same plant, and on the other part of it, that area was mowed. <clears throat> in my experience, if you live in an area that receives greater than 35 inches of annual precipitation, mowing is probably going to be a more important establishment technique for you. If you want to mow, if you think that you want to mow, there's a couple of keys. And the first key is when to start. What you do not want to do is what's happening in this photo. You do not want to wait until the vegetation that you're going to mow is so tall, so thick, that you're creating a mulch when you mow it. If you want to mow your pollinator planting at the appropriate height, which is 10 to 12 inches, do not mow it below 10 inches in height. Well, if you're gonna do a first mowing, you probably wanna do that first mowing when your vegetation is about 18 to 20 inches tall so that you're clipping it, but not creating a mulch. If you uh, are in an area that gets abundant rainfall, a frequency of mowing is probably two times in one year and maybe once in year two, and then you shouldn't need to mow after that. And you need to understand that if you have a lot of annuals in your planting, that mowing uh, can very quickly remove those annuals from your project and your planting. Prescribed fire is another great management tool. Prescribed fire is great because of things like this photo right here. This is a pollinator planting that the year before, you probably would not have found a milkweed plant out there. And this year, the next year following prescribed fire, set back succession, milkweed and other pollinators showed up with abundance. One of the forms of prescribed fire that you might want to think about is doing a growing season burn. A growing season burn has flame lengths that are much more calm, much slower burn, and really enhances your wildflowers. This is an example of that same field the year following a growing season burn and the abundance of wildflowers that showed up following that burn. Green fire breaks can be used to help you do a burn and can be part of your pollinator planting by using forage legumes to give you a green fire break and provide pollinator value. Here's an example of an aerial photo of a larger project that had green fire breaks put in there. And then this area was burned on a rotation where each section of this field was burned in a different year. So over the course of time, over the course of six years, this pollinator planting will be in six different stages of development. I talked about uh, fly gl fall glyphosate spraying earlier in this presentation, but remember that if you have a pollinator planting, that has cool season grasses that are taking over it, doing a fall spring after a hard freeze when all your wildflowers have gone dormant for the year and your grasses are still growing can produce great results and set back that grass for you. So um, I guess really one of the main topics and things to take away from management is there is nothing that we can do where you plant it, walk away from it, and always have great pollinator habitat. You need to do a little something each and every year. And if you do that, um, you're going to have great results and great pollinator habitat. 
So I just want to wrap up the presentation today by telling you a little bit about an option that can provide free pollinator seed for you. And that is through an organization named the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. It's a nonprofit that's been around for a couple of years now and is doing great things out there. It comes to you with a couple of key objectives. One, to get great pollinator habitat on the ground. And the second one is to demonstrate what great pollinator habitat looks like that's cost effective, establishes quickly, and provides great pollinator habitat value. And the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund offers a pollinator program that's called Seed a Legacy that provides free pollinator seed mixtures for projects in different areas across the country. And right now, the area that we're working in is a 12 state area. Michigan is included in this area. A 12 state area that is working to provide free pollinator seed mixtures. And that area is selected. That 12 state area is selected based on two things. One is the area of work in the country, the area that's been identified that if we want to impact monarch butterflies, where we need to be focusing our work. And that's the areas of the country in this photo that are red, orange, and yellow. And the second thing is, it's been selected based on the areas of the country that are most critically important for beekeeping. So the Seed a Legacy program is open to private, public, and corporate land, which you should consider really to be any kind of land. For projects that are two acres or larger, and if you submit an application and your site preparation is in place and you're ready to plant, right now we're accepting 100% of those applications. And we deliver our pollinator projects in two ways. We divide every project into half, and on half of it we plant a mixture that is designed to benefit honeybees, and on the other half of it we design a mixture that is there to benefit monarch butterflies. In the honeybee mixture, we use forage legume species and include those in there because those are the species that honeybees really significantly benefit from. This is a study that looked at the actual pollen that bees were bringing back to the hive and took it right down to what plant species they were using. And those uh, forage legume species were critically important. In the monarch butterfly mixture, we use the native wildflower species that are adapted to that area and make sure that milkweed is included in there and have those seed mixtures being documented right now. The pollinator value of our seed mixtures is being evaluated through three different programs uh, that are out there, three different research programs. And uh, Julia, my slide is not advancing anymore. So I might need you to come in there and advance it with me, for me. Did that change for you, Pete? Mm, nope, I'm still not advancing. It's still not advancing. So if you could maybe advance it for me, it's about done. Okay. Um, I just switched the screen for you. Did it not change on your screen? Nope. So if you could take, uh, oh, so you're advancing it and I'm not seeing it. Yes. Right? So right now I'm on the um, screen that says commercial beekeeping. Oh, okay. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to, I'm going to fly blind and I'm going to try to tell you what I was talking about right now. Um, I think that, uh, I, I had a slide in there that said pollinators are a unique kind of glue. Yes, and that I'm on that one now. Can impact. Yep. So go forward. That in, that can impact commercial beekeeping. Uh, the next one, food sustainability. The next one, please, water quality. Um, and just go through those, Julia. All kinds 
of different things that uh, that range from roadsides, um, utility companies, solar power, all of those kinds of different issues can be connected by great pollinator habitat. And what slide are you on now, Julia? Precision agriculture. All right, precision agriculture. Keep going for me, please. And just read off uh, what's on there for me. Okay. Um, row and utilities. Yep. Uh, right of ways and utilities. Advance, please. Endangered species. Yep. There's another uh, thing that we certainly don't want any more endangered species, and like the rusty patch bumblebee there. Next one, please. Joining diverse interests. And it just has the opportunity to bring together people from all kinds of different backgrounds. Next one, please. Um, this one is a picture of wildflowers. Should yeah, and if you would hit going. the advance button, this is really just kind of wrapping it up, saying that whether your interests are pollinators or grazing or grassland songbirds or pheasants and quail, pollinator habitat can impact all of those things. Next one, please. Okay, and then it's the habitat tip videos. Yeah, and I guess I just kind of wanted to wrap this up. There's uh, only two more slides after this. Um, that um, we produce a number of habitat tip videos on a monthly basis that are designed to talk about pollinator habitat and cover many of the things in this presentation today. So please check that out. If you advance, please, you can follow um, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund on all the different kinds of social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. And the next one, please, and that should be just a reminder about Craig's incentive that is out there to work with crop consultants. Oh, yeah. And then the next one. Sorry, Pete, I just want to one note on that. I forgot to mention at the intro on that in incentive program. Um, it is only eligible, only available in four states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Iowa, and Illinois. And for anything that's seeded in this calendar year of 2019. Okay. And then the, uh, the last slide on there is just my contact information. Um, and, and also uh, a thank you to uh, Fan County Foundation and PARM and just uh, everybody that was on the call today uh, appreciated the opportunity to chat about these things and if we have a minute or two where we can take a question I'd be happy to do that if we still have time. Yeah um, okay thank you Pete for sharing all of this information with us today and we do have time for Q&A so the first question we'll get started with is um, I missed the beginning of the presentation, and I'm not sure if this was already mentioned, but for cash grain crops such as corn, soybeans, and wheat, is there a formula for pollinator habitat to cropland that is ideal? Well, <clears throat> it really goes back to we want to design uh, pollinator habitat for each individual project. Um, we want to be looking at all of those many different factors of soil type, what their objectives are, and that sort of thing. So I would say that the best scenario is where we're working with that individual project. Okay, and the next question is, is there a type of plant is there a type of plantings that can be used for pasture as long as they are not overgrazed? Cert certainly there are, there absolutely are. Um, and that again is an objective that would influence how we wanna design that project and that seed mixture. And then also future management, how we're going to apply grazing uh, to the site. So uh, the answer is absolutely. All right, and next question is, what is the best way to manage weed pressure without spending too much money? Well, 
there is no one answer that I can, I feel like I'm giving the same answer for everything, Julia. It really depends on that project um, because that, that answer is going to be influenced by what vegetation, what weeds are we interested in trying to control? How abundant is it? Why is it on the site? And so a, a different management technique would be designed for each site that could include um, fire, could include herbicides, mowing, grazing, uh, light disking. There's a number of different tools that could be used and some of them could be combined as well. Okay, next question is, I have a bad burdock problem in my bee habitat. What can I do to eliminate? <clears throat> well, that's a pretty specific question and I uh, would prefer to give an answer actually having uh, seen the site, but Burdock is a very, very early successional stage plant. And what that means is if we can design a pollinator planting that will establish quickly and then be managed uh, and, and be thriving, that burdock is very likely going to disappear because it's an early successional stage planting. So I would manage the burdock by designing a great pollinator seed mixture and then making sure it gets established real well. All right, and next question is, even if you minimum tilled a grass covered soil for pollinator seed mixes, how do you deal with um, noxious weeds like Canadian thistle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a great question and definitely a concern. So Canadian thistle is very likely could be something that you haven't seen on a site for many years, maybe a decade. And if those grasses are removed and the soil is disturbed, all of a sudden they show back up. Canada thistle and some other um, introduced thistle species are things that just sit there and hang around in the ground and you might not have seen them in years and all of a sudden they come back. Um, so the importance of knowing the history of your site is really important. And if you know that you have that on the site, that will really significantly influence how you do your site preparation. So one of the ways probably that I would recommend it is, it, is I would put a full year of site prep in, maybe even more, and I would use cover crops during the site preparation process to control those invasive, and in this case, noxious weeds from coming back onto the site. All right, and the next question is, what month do you do your growing season burns in to avoid nesting birds? Please discuss how burning mm -hmm. also helps with invasive species. Sure, so growing season burns, um, it, de it depends on what your objectives are. I personally conduct them in September when most of uh, the ground nesting bird activity is done. But also remember that um, in the example that I provided, prescribed fire, if it's being done right, is not being applied to the entire project. It's being applied to a portion of it. And that's the way that I do growing season burns. So you're, you're not removing that pollinator habitat and cover for all the pollinators or ground nesting birds, um, but you're applying it to a portion of the area. All right, and the last question we'll do is, how feasible is complete implementation on extremely large acreage sites, such as 500 to 5,000 acres? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the, the three biggest factors if you're talking about 500, 500 to a thousand acres would be one time do you have enough time to do that two budget do you have enough budget to be able to do it and three equipment do you have the equipment that can work on that large of an area the principles of what you would do on one acre 
is the same principle that you do on 500 acres. Uh, how you apply it, what the management plan is. The scale is completely different. So it really comes down to if you're doing a really big project like that, do you have enough time? Do you have enough budget? And do you have the equipment? You know, and factored in there with time and budget and equipment is do you have enough people to do it and all of that kind of stuff. But the principles of what you're doing on one acre can be the same as what you're doing on a really large project. Okay. In the interest of time, I'd like to wrap up the Q&A. I want to thank you again, Pete, for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your work. Absolutely. It's been, it's been really fun. Thank you. Okay. At this time, I want to recognize our premier egg retailer members, the Andersons, a gold member, and silver members, Gerti Egg and Nutrien Egg Solutions. Their contribution helped make this webinar possible and help promote the strides that egg retailers like you are making to reduce nutrient impairments. I would also like to acknowledge our participating egg retailers that represent more than 5 million acres in the Great Lakes and Upper Mississippi River basins. If you are an egg retailer interested in becoming a member or participating with PARM to receive tools and resources to increase sales and information on our latest cost shares, please contact our project manager at Caitlin at partnershipfarm.org or visit our website and click Become a Member to fill out our online form. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge additional funders and collaborators that made this webinar possible. In particular, the McKnight Foundation, the Sand County Foundation, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, and Clean Lakes Alliance. As we wrap up, please remember to look for the follow-up email in a few days with a webinar evaluation and webinar recording. If you submitted your CCA number at registration and are viewing this webinar live or the recording within two weeks of the original date, your CEUs will be automatically submitted. Only if you are watching the recording more than two weeks after the original broadcast will you need to email julia at partnershipfarm.org your CCA number to ensure your CEUs are submitted. I want to thank you all again for joining us today, and I hope you join us again for our next webinar later this month.